Hello and welcome to Tech Deals MSI GeForce GTX 1080 Ti Duke Factory Overclock Graphics Card Unboxing and Overview. Now what is this? Why should you watch and why should you care? Well in short, if you are looking for a premium top of the line graphics card, if you want something that will play with the best of the best, do you want to play at 1440p ultra wide or 4K resolution? Do you want ultra high refresh rates? Do you want a future proofed card that will last you for many, many, many years with plenty of performance and plenty of VRAM for the next generation of games? Then stop, you have definitely come to the right place. Now before I get into the unboxing, let me just refresh you on the GTX 1080 Ti in general. It is the premium top tier graphics card from Nvidia. It is a solid 35% faster than a 1080. It's more than 50% faster than a 1070. And it's a solid 100% faster than a GTX 1060 or an RX 580 from the AMD side. It really is that much faster. 11 gigabytes of VRAM. Within the useful lifetime of this card, you are never going to run out of VRAM with 11 gigabytes of VRAM. And it's very, very fast VRAM as well. The 1080 Ti excels at high refresh rate gaming, high resolution gaming, ultra wide or 4K. It supports VR, of course. It supports multiple monitors. It basically is the do everything graphics card and it should for the price tag that it asks for. However, please keep in mind that when you spend more you get more. You can absolutely get great gaming performance by buying a lower end graphics card, but you'll have to replace it sooner. It will become obsolete sooner. One of the benefits of buying a good card like this is you may very well get three to five years of gaming out of it, depending upon your tolerance for resolution, refresh rate, and game detail settings, of course. All graphics card fall by the wayside at some point, but by spending more, you put off when you need to upgrade in the future. For now, that's enough talking. Why don't we open this up and see what the card itself looks like. Then I'll talk a little bit more about games, resolutions, how it compares to other cards, and I'll show you a couple of benchmarks. I do have to say that this is a very nice, very large box. I also have to say thank you to MSI for sending me this card. And with the plastic off the box, let's take a look inside. Each one of these boxes opens up just a little bit differently. There we go. So this one opens from the back. I know it's a box, but you know, it's fun. It's a nice graphics card. The way MSI does these is they've got handles on the inside and you actually pull it out straight like this. There we go. Rather than having the box, now I have a nice display box. Rather than having it open on one end and pull out, it comes out of the top. And you can see here, they've got the MSI logo. I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but the MSI logo is printed in black on the black on this box. And this uh, little cardboard insert here, I imagine just has driver CDs, which you shouldn't be using anyway. Oh, interesting, it's in an envelope. Oh, that's very nice. Is there anything else in there? There is. Oh, an adapter, okay. We'll set that aside. This is a, let's open this up and see what this is. Six pin to eight pin PCI Express power connector. Use this if your power supply does not have two eight pin connectors, if it has one six pin and one eight pin. Do keep in mind that there's a reason why there's two eight pins, but given the power draw of this, actually if you have a decent name brand, um, Corsair, EBGA, Seasonic, if you have a name brand power supply, you'd be fine using this. But frankly, if you're buying a $750 card and you don't have two eight pin PCI Express power connectors, buy a new power supply. Put that in my trash pile. Look at this, everything else comes in this nice brown envelope. I don't think I've seen this from MSI before. If I ever seem like I'm impressed with packaging, keep in mind, good products usually come in good packaging. Cheap products usually come in cheap packaging. There are exceptions, but usually if, if they take care to package it well, then they took care designing the card, usually. Is there anything else in here? Nope, that's empty. We have a quick user's guide in case you've never used one of these before. Oh, well, that's nice, a bunch of different languages. And then if we fold this out, And you can see here, there are a lot of languages. Each one of those little squares is a language, and then more. There's just little diagrams here basically saying, here's how you put a graphics card in your computer. Well, we'll put that down there. Then we have a driver CD. Does this come with a sticker for your computer? I don't think so. 
Nope. You know where this goes? This goes on the desk to be used as a coaster for your coffee mug. Don't use the CD that comes with this thing, please. Go to NVIDIA.com, download the latest drivers, really. And then we come to the reason you came to this video in the first place, the graphics card. Thank you for choosing an MSI product. Please register at our website. Actually, you should. While it's convenient, while you've got the box with the serial number, while you've got the card, do go register on their website. If you ever need warranty service, you won't then need a proof of purchase because if you register it when you buy it, you activate your warranty and then you can always get warranty service there without having to figure out, oh, when did I buy this? Can I register it? So go do that. This is packed nicely in here. Take a look. It is in an antistatic bag, and then it is in form-fitting foam all the way around. Look how big that is. This is, by the way, noticeably larger than the MSI Gaming X cards. Those are two-fan designs, twin-frozer designs. This is a tri-frozer or three-fan design. Now, is MSI attempting to replace the Gaming X? No, they're still selling the Gaming X, not to worry. A lot of people like the branding of the Gaming X. A lot of people like the red and black motif on it. It's just a different design. So. Different card, different design. This one does not have the red on it, but it is full RGB. And we will take it out of the packaging. Wow, and they kept the red just for style. Now these are all, you pull these off. Um, these are just covers for the video ports. But look at that card. That is a big, that's heavy. That is a big, big, heavy card. And the heat sink is massive. It's not unnecessarily large. Look at the heat sink back here extending all the way to the third fan, even longer than the printed circuit board on the card. This has eight millimeter heat pipes. They're large heat pipes. It has got a reinforced back plate structure that connects to the heat sink. So part of the back plate screws through in I think eight or nine different points. I'd have to look again, but it, it screws through and creates a very rigid. How rigid is this? Oh, that is actually really solid. Um, I've tested a lot of cards on my channel. I've looked at a lot of cards, and actually when they get this big, a lot of times they do flex. And I remember reading in the marketing materials that it's designed to have anti-flex. It's got an extra plate in here for that, and no. I'm actually pushing my thumbs against it, and it's not budging, so that's a good sign. The fans appear to smooth. Oh, do keep in mind you gotta take these little stickers off of the center. You don't want those coming off inside your machine. There we go. Yeah, this has been very, very nice. Now, this has lights in here. Will I do a video showing this lit up? I might, we'll see. You can certainly look at MSI's website. I'll link to it in the description below. They've got pictures of all the different RGB colors you can light up on this. You've got the Duke logo up here on the top. You've got the GeForce GTX. Now, the GeForce GTX does not light up, but the Duke logo does. And the fans light up as well. On the back, you have got a configuration that just screams, I want to be used for virtual reality. We have two HDMI 2.0 ports supporting 4K at 60 hertz. We have two DisplayPort 1.4 supporting 4K at 120 hertz or 8K at 60 hertz when we eventually get appropriate monitors. And you do have a DVI-D port, which really probably you aren't gonna use with this video card because it's designed for modern high-end monitors, but you could if you need to. And this will absolutely support multiple monitors. If you're looking at gaming on three 1080p or three 1440p monitors, this is absolutely the card that you wanna buy. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but um, great multi-monitor support. And you can see here, We've got uh, two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors. This card is rated at 250 watts. I imagine you could probably push it past that with overclocking. We're gonna take a look at that here in a minute. But it does have two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors. Make sure that your power supply has them. Honestly, as I said before, if you're buying a $750 graphics card, you probably should. One more quick note. I pulled off the red connector so you'd see what it would really look like in your machine. This is the top of the card, and this is how it would be installed in your machine where you can see the logos. The fans, of course, generally point down unless you have a very custom rig. You can see the MSI logo here is printed correctly so that it faces outward, you can see it. Now, this is not light up, this is just printed, but it is in white, so it shouldn't clash. Uh, some other cards put yellow or red or other things on here, so it does have the MSI logo in white, but I think it looks nice and classy, and frankly, inside of a dark computer, it's probably not going to show up very much. Overall, a very nice looking card.
So that's it for the unboxing. What about the overview and benchmarks? Benchmarks in a minute, but please note that there will be a link in the video description below to all of my 1080 Ti benchmarks if you're interested in seeing more games, more processors, and more detail settings. As far as what this card is for and who should buy it, I kind of said that at the beginning of the video, but let me go into a little bit more detail. I said just a minute ago that if you want to do multi-monitor gaming, it's the perfect card, and it really, really is. If you have three monitors and you want to do NVIDIA Surround ultra-wide gaming, which is not supported on all games, but it's supported on a lot of games these days. Everything from MMOs such as World of Warcraft, Star Wars, The Old Republic, and others, World of Tanks, World of Warships, League of Legends, um, Overwatch notably is a game that does not support it for fair gameplay reasons. I'm actually surprised some others do, such as League of Legends, but they do. If you want to be able to play with three monitors and have an extremely wide field of view, keep in mind that even 1080p times three is six million pixels. That's a million more than 1440p ultra wide and only 2.3 million less than 4K. If you're actually looking at playing graphically demanding games on three 1080p screens, you really do need the performance of a 1080 Ti. A 1080 will do it, but a 1080 Ti will have the VRAM for it and give you the future proofing needed to get you more than a year or two use out of it before the 1080 starts to run out of steam at the 6 million pixel count. Now, let me talk about the top of the line 4K. 8.3 million pixels, there's no other card to buy. If you want to play modern AAA gaming titles at 4K resolution, they're really, yes, a 1080 will do it. Heck, even a 1070 will do it for certain titles. A 1070 will kind of sort of play GTA 5 at 4K with the details turned down a bit if you have a really fast processor. But that game is a year and a half old and it's kind of the exception that proves the rule. Do you want to play Battlefield 1, Ghost Recon Wildlands, Prey, Mass Effect Andromeda at anything approaching reasonable detail levels and reasonable frame rates? It's 1080 Ti or bust. Now what about 1440p? There are two different 1440p resolutions, standard and ultra wide. Standard is 3.6 million pixels. Now this is still a very good card for standard 1440p. A little bit overkill in modern games. You don't need to spend this much. A 1070 or a 1080 would be enough. However, you get more performance, higher refresh rates, and more future proofing with a 1080 Ti. Now, what about 1440p ultra wide? 1440p ultra wide, the 21 uh, 9 screens are 5 million pixels. It's 1.4 million more than standard 1440p. It actually brings it quite close to 4K relative to 1080p. If you want to play at 1440p ultra wide, if you have yourself a nice Dell, Acer, Asus, 34 inch 1440p monitor, let's be honest, if you have one of those monitors, this should not be in the realm of unaffordability. Nice card for those monitors. Many of those monitors will overclock and run at anywhere between 80 to 100 hertz refresh rate, and this card will give you the performance with the appropriately powerful CPU to play games at 80 to 100 frames a second at 1440p ultra wide. Finally, that brings us to standard 1080p. If you have one 1080p monitor, do you need a 1080 Ti? No, not at all. It is way, way overkill. You can, you'll get incredible performance and you can play everything at ultra max detail with no compromises. I recently did a video showing Ghost Recon Wildlands at ultra detail at 1080p on a GTX 1080 Ti, and many of you were quite surprised to see how just poorly it really did perform. But ultra is crushing to games. If you turn Ghost Recon Wildlands down to very high detail, you'll get a dramatic performance improvement and the quality doesn't actually drop off that much. I challenge you to really tell the difference between very high and ultra in Ghost Recon without pausing the video or looking at screenshots, actually playing the game. Me personally, I use a 1080 Ti personally to play Ghost Recon Wildland at 4K at high detail. It's over 60 frames a second, it performs really well and at high detail that game looks very, very good. What would I recommend for standard 1080p? Well, at the moment, in July of 2017 when I'm filming this, either an RX 560 or a GTX 1050 Ti. Why? Because the RX 580s and GTX 1060s, which I would normally recommend, are basically sold out everywhere. So either step up to a 1080 or 1080 Ti or step down to a 1050 Ti or an RX 560 and live with it for a few months until the supply situation gets caught up. Now, if you're watching this video in the future, that's irrelevant because they'll probably be caught up and you can just buy a 1060 or perhaps a 1070 for 1080p gaming. But in July of 2017, they're nowhere to be found. So get either a 1080 Ti 
DPI and just live with it at medium detail at 1080p or step up to this massive awesome card and have no compromise gaming for several years to come. Next you might ask, which 1080 Ti should I buy? Should I buy this one? Should I buy something else? Well, linked in the description below to my full list of 1080 Ti videos will be the which 1080 Ti should you buy. In that, I compared three different cards. I didn't have this at the time. Uh, but my general advice in that video still applies. It's not performance that should get you to choose one over the other. It's features, brand, what game comes with it, what ports are on the back. As I said before, this has two HDMI and two display ports. If you have an Oculus Rift or a HTC Vive VR headset, that's perfect. Plug one of those into your main monitor, plug your VR headset into the other, and you are good to go. Some other cards have one HDMI and three display ports. That might be good if you have multiple monitors and you want to plug DisplayPort into all of them. Although please note that if your monitors support both HDMI and DisplayPort, then it doesn't really matter because they're both essentially fully compatible and will run the same resolutions. So just make sure that you're not trying to get three HDMI only or three DisplayPort only monitors if you're getting a card like this. But that's probably a very unusual situation. Is there a difference in three fans versus two? Not really, it's mostly a style and thickness difference. Now one nice thing about the Duke is it is a thinner card physically from say the Gaming X from MSI. What they did with the Gaming X is when they shortened it a bit to two fans, they made it thicker. So it's more than a two slot card, whereas the Duke is a true two slot card. You could put two of these together and either have a gap in the middle if your motherboard supports um, three slot separation, or if your motherboard only supports two cards side by side and you want to SLI them, you can fit two of these side by side. Although I do recommend that if you're going to do that, get a motherboard with triple uh, slot support because then you'll actually have a gap between the cards and you'll have airflow in here, which definitely helps with heat and thermal temperatures. Now what sort of computer should this be installed into? Ideally, it would be installed in a recently built custom machine with a 600 watt or greater name brand power supply with either the AMD Ryzen 7 or the i7-7700K KB Lake from Intel or one of the new Skylake X chips, the 6, 8, or 10 core high-end enthusiast desktop chips that Intel just launched in the past two weeks. However, don't count out older CPUs just yet. If you have either the Skylake or Haswell i7 from Intel, say an i7-6700 or an i7-4770 or 4790K, this card would be just fine. In fact, downstairs, I have one of my 1080 Ti's installed in my streaming PC, which is an i7-4790K Haswell 4th Gen Refresh from Intel. Works just fine. Would I install it in something older, such as a second gen uh, Sandy Bridge, the i7-2600K? We're gonna find out. I will do a series of benchmarks in the uh, upcoming days where I put this into a variety of machines and do a doesn't matter what CPU you have. I've done those in the past, but I did them with a different lower end video card. I'm gonna put this in there and see how well it does with a top of the line graphics card. Now, would I install this in the older AMD chips, the FX6300, the FX8300 series from AMD? Not really, I don't recommend it. You can, it will work, but you're really gonna be held back in a lot of games and a lot of titles with this much uh, graphics horsepower with CPUs that when multi-threaded applications are running are great, but are pretty poor in single core performance. It's an option, and if you're planning on upgrading later within the next six months, maybe at the end of the year, you can't do everything at once, I understand. I will see if I can put this into the FX8300 pre-built that I did from a few months ago. Ironically, that was a $600 total cost system. This card costs more than a whole computer does, but I'm sure people would like to know how well it runs, and I will see if I can do those tests at some point in the future. Okay, that's enough overview. Let's go take a look at some benchmark results. Quick note, this is going to be shown to you today in my $1,500 i7-7700K build. I am running that CPU today at a fixed 5 GHz clock speed with 16 GB of DDR4 3200 MHz RAM. Link in the video description below to my full playlist on that build and all the benchmarks I've done on that computer. With no further ado, let's go take a look at the benchmarks. First up, we have Mankind Divided. Now we are testing six different games on this card today. The first five games I'm only doing at 4K to keep the video reasonably short, but the last game we're gonna do at 1080p, 1440p, and 4K. 
Now in just a few minutes, there's going to be benchmark charts showing these numbers in a bar graph form, but I think it's important to put the real time performance numbers because it shows so much more than charts do. For example, you can see the real time VRAM usage, the temperature of the card, the fan speed of the card, what clock speed it's running at. You can see how much main system RAM is being used and of course the real time frame rate. Now I am using these six games built in benchmarks. That's for time and expediency reasons. I will do live game performance benchmarks on this card in other machines. When I do the i7-2600K versus i7-7700K, I'm gonna put this machine into both Ryzen 7 as well as the new eight core Skylake X uh, systems and I might depending upon if there's any interest stick it into the FX8300 as I mentioned before and see how well it does in that machine. But those sorts of videos are more in depth and they require their own videos. So built in benchmarks are generally used for these kinds of videos where I'm doing either a product review or I'm doing a product comparison video versus actually sitting down and playing 15 to 20 minutes in a game on three different machines or five different machines or whatever it is and putting it into a single video. So this has been the built-in benchmark to Mankind Divided. As you can see here, the frame rate at 4K resolution is just atrocious, but that's the game. It's that bad on everything. It's worth keeping that in mind. Now we have For Honor. Now For Honor is definitely gonna perform better, and it's a newer game, but what can I say? It's better coded than Mankind Divided, or perhaps it's better coded for the systems that actually exist today. The fact that Mankind Divided was running below 60 frames per second on a 1080 Ti, which didn't even exist when the game came out, clearly indicates that that game is brutal in performance. And please note, all the games you're seeing today are being run at high detail. That information will all be on the benchmark charts, but what you're watching is at 4K at high detail, not even max detail, which just demonstrates that while this is the perfect 1440p gaming card, at least as it exists in the summer of 2017, it also represents why if you wanna play games at 4K, it's 1080 Ti or bust. The fact of the matter is not all these games run over 60 frames per second on a 1080 Ti. Trying to do this on a 1080 or 1070 would just be absolutely brutal. Now, do you need this card for Overwatch and League of Legends at 4K? Absolutely not. Those will run just fine at 4K on lower end cards. I've shown those benchmarks in the past, but for AAA games, which is what I'm showing you here, it's a 1080 Ti. Now this next game that I'm gonna show you here, Rainbow Six Siege, is kind of a hybrid. It's not quite a AAA gaming title and it's not quite an eSports title. It's sort of in the middle. It is extremely well optimized and designed to run on a wide variety of systems and graphics cards. Now we are playing this today using the high detail preset at 4K. It definitely goes higher than high. You could turn it up if you want prettier graphics. But I think that in this kind of game, competitive online multiplayer, having extremely high refresh rates, even if your monitor doesn't support it, it does reduce input lag a little bit. You can see here we're nearly at 100 frames per second here. This is by far the best performing game that I'm going to show you today. We are looking at nearly 100 frames a second, in fact over 100 frames a second at points at 4K resolution. That is really, really good. But look at the frame rate right now. We're at 118, almost 120. This is why I'm showing you the video. Yes, it's great. It's 126 frames per second, but we're outside and nothing's going on. When we were inside with the characters and explosions, it was around 95 frames per second. Keep that in mind when you look at the charts here in just a minute. Finally, we have Rise of the Tomb Raider, a game that recently got an update both for Ryzen support as well as for DirectX 12 support. Now, I am doing this today in DirectX 12. The Mankind Divided was also done in DirectX 12 for what it's worth, but you can see in the MSI Afterburner numbers, you can see the D3D12 on the bottom line. That means we're running in DirectX 12. Now, because this video was recorded at 4K, the only way to do it was to use NVIDIA's Shadow Play. However, because I'm running built-in benchmarks, I did something a bit different here. I ran the benchmark three times without Shadow Play recording. I made note of the times and recorded the middle one. Then I ran it with Shadow Play on, recorded the video, but discarded that result. So what you're watching is the recorded footage from the computer, but the benchmark charts you're gonna see in a minute is from when Shadow Play was not running. Shadow Play normally takes between five to 10 frames per second off of your performance, depending upon what resolution, detail, etc. that you are running at, but it does impact performance. So 
The numbers you are going to see in the charts in just a minute are from Shadowplay not running, whereas the video you're watching is going to be a little bit slower than those charts because Shadowplay was running for me to record this video. That is an amazingly detailed world, is it not? Uh, Rise of the Tomb Raider remains one of the prettiest games out there, right up there with some of the best. Beautiful world and scenery. Very crushing on performance in places though. Now we're going to look at The Division, a game I did not think I would like. I played it back around December. I got really frustrated around level 10. I didn't quite get up to speed with the gear and I was trying to do missions I didn't have the right gear and armor for and I kept dying over and over. I put the game away for a few months, came back to it, looked up some guides, realized my mistake, and now I have finished it. I've completed the main story. You've seen that in previous game performance videos that I've posted in the past. It, it actually has gotten a lot more fun since I've figured the game out. While this game is just over a year old now, it still is beautiful. Look at New York. Well, okay, it's a mess. But the world environment that this renders in New York is just, they put so much work into it. And the fact that we're above 60 frames per second at high detail at 4K resolution, with, look at that, you can read the words, you can read the signs. In fact, if you run around in the subway, for example, you can read the entire subway map of lower Manhattan. It's incredible. Now, actually, this plays pretty well, even at ultra detail, but I have it set to high here, which I usually don't benchmark on the division. I usually do ultra, but I did high here to make every game on high to kind of spread it evenly across the board. Certainly in games like Rainbow Six Siege and The Division here, you could crank the detail up a bit if you want. Turn V-Sync on, it'll be a fixed 60 frames a second and you'll have no issues with performance. Now these five games were all just done at 4K resolution. I will test other resolutions when I do the live gameplay and put it between machines because perhaps not all of them, especially the older machines, might do 4K as well. I don't know. I haven't tried it on a top-end graphics card like a 1080 Ti, but we will do that at some point in the future. Now we're doing Ghost Recon. What you are watching here is 1080p. We're doing 1080p, 1440p and 4K. Now why in the world would we be doing 1080p? Didn't we already test this? Yes, but we tested this using a different card and different detail settings. This is high detail. Some people want to know what does it take to play at high refresh rates on lower resolution monitors. Traditionally, it's how do we get 60 frames per second and what do we need at 1080p or even 4K, for example. But what if you want to play at 144 frames per second? What if you have a 144 hertz 1080p monitor? Can a 1060 or 1070 do that? Well, yeah, probably at low detail, but not at high. Here we are on a $750 graphics card on a overclocked i7 7700K at 5 gigahertz with DDR4 3200 megahertz RAM and we're right at about 144 frames per second in Ghost Recon Wildland. Now some of that's the game. Many other games will run much better than this even on lower end cards at 1080p. But if you want to run all games at 144 frames per second, if you want to get comfortably over 100 frames per second in everything, yes, even at 1080p, a 1080 Ti is not overkill. Now this right here is 1440p. Notice the lower frame rate, we're right down around 100 frames per second. Again, as I said before, you are watching the recorded video with NVIDIA Shadowplay, but I benchmarked this outside of Shadowplay. So not to worry, the numbers you'll see at the, in the chart in just a minute are reflective of not recording rather than recording. As you can see here, we are getting spectacular performance. Why does this matter? If you have a 100 Hertz 1440p, either standard or ultra widescreen, this is why a 1080 Ti is not overkill. In fact, this is standard 1440p here. Add 1.4 million pixels, knock off perhaps 20 frames per second if this were 1440p ultra wide. If you want to get 1440p ultra wide at a fixed 100 frames per second, you actually would have to run at medium detail, or at least you'd have to go in and maybe turn shadows down, turn anti-aliasing down. You'd have to make a few adjustments. This does very well at standard 1440p, but if you want 100 frames a second, yeah, even in Ghost Recon, compromises are required. Now I'm showing you the 4K run. Now we're certainly not going to be getting 100 plus frames per second, even at high detail, but notice that we are above 60 frames per second. Again, 
this is the recorded run, so it's even better than that on the non-recorded run, which is the numbers I actually used. But if you want to play games at 4K resolution, a 1080, for example, would be down in the 30s and 40s at this point. It's comfortably 35% slower than this card. This really is the one you want to buy for 4K gaming. So that's enough of the actual benchmark video itself. Let me show you some results. Here are the first five games. I'm splitting them into two charts because these five games were only tested at 4K. So high detail preset. You can see here we have 52, 87, 118, 85, and 75 frames per second average respectively. I'm not bothering to report the max, it just clutters up the chart. The max isn't really important in my opinion anyway because that's just when nothing's happening or standing outside. The red bars are the minimum. The division's built-in benchmark does not report a minimum, so I'm not putting it on here. I use the built-in benchmarks for all of these games rather than trying to use Fraps. Fraps introduces human error. When do I press F11 to start and stop the run? So these are the built-in benchmarks. As you can see here, every game except Mankind Divided is comfortably over 60 frames per second, massively so in several cases. This is why the 1080 Ti is the one to buy, because not only are the averages important, but so are minimums. Take a look at that minimum in Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now there's several different scenes in Rise of the Tomb Raider. For the minimum, I took the lowest of the three numbers and reported that the average, they give you an average of all three. It definitely drops down, even at high detail. As far as For Honor and Rainbow Six Siege, no issue. The Division wouldn't be an issue as well. I've played enough of the Division to tell you that would be comfortably at 60 plus frames per second, 99% of the time. Mankind Divided is brutal. Now, I am not a player of that game, and so you'll have to decide whether or not you think the built-in benchmark is reflective of the gameplay, because I honestly don't play Mankind Divided. I run the built-in benchmark. Hopefully, it's useful to those of you who do play that game. That brings us to our second chart, Ghost Recon Wildlands. 1080p, 1440p, 4K. You can see the frame rate scaling here runs very nicely. Now, this is the built-in benchmark, but the actual game isn't too far off this. The lows, the dips aren't too far off this. Overall, it's pretty Pretty representative. I was saying earlier, if you have a 1080p 144 hertz monitor, yes, you need a 1080 Ti high detail in this game. Do you have a 100 hertz 1440p monitor? There you go, 107 frames per second. And then finally, 4K at 66 frames per second. Now, currently, 4K monitors are generally all 60 hertz panels. So going over 60 hertz doesn't really matter so much because your monitor can't display it anyway. But that's changing soon. Uh, this year, there have been several several announcements that there's going to be some 100 and 120 hertz 4K panels coming out, but frankly, it's really irrelevant at this point. They're going to be expensive when they first launch, and the 1080 Ti really doesn't have the horsepower to do it anyway. You want to wait for the next generation of cards if you're interested in that sort of thing, but those monitors are going to be expensive. So, for the moment, 60 hertz, 60 frames per second, 4K, 100 at 1440, or 144 at 1080p is a really good place for the GTX 1080 Ti. And so there you have it, the MSI GeForce GTX 1080 Ti Duke factory overclock graphics card installed in the i7-7700K. Future benchmarks in other processors will be coming soon. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge red button directly below. Questions and comments below the video and as always check out the links in the video description. Links to all the playlists and videos I mentioned, links to Amazon and Newegg to buy this and the full line of 1080 Ti cards will be down there as well. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in my next video.